Hi, thank you uh, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you about today is the power of social networks in making predictions. This is actually what my, my company does. Um, so you've heard a little bit about me. Uh, basically, what we've done with the company is the stuff that I'm going to show you today. And it's a kind of a new way of making predictions and doing polling. And I hope you'll, you'll find it interesting. Right, so um, I'm the CEO of Oracle, and we're a company where we're kind of branding ourselves as a data science company, and we uh, managed to successfully make a few predictions, especially specifically elect election predictions. Uh, so Brexit, Trump, Biden, etc. And we did it with incredible accuracy. So the way we typically do this is that we use a sort of a, we, we call this a, a, a science-based forecasting poll. And the name is Bayesian Adjusted Social Network Survey. I'll show you why Bayesian. Okay, so there is a certain statistical Bayesian probability element. And the point of the whole methodology is that we've uh, redesigned it. Um, and we redesigned polling and we redesigned the way of, of making predictions. So that's, that's basically I the idea. And we do this by using uh, a social network analysis. Before I explain the intricacies of this, of this approach, just a little simple way of how this usually works so that you can get the idea. So typically we do, we're commissioned to do a piece of research or a prediction or something. Um, so what we do usually is we poll people on social media. So we do social media ads, for example, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Google ads, Instagram, etc. And then we get them to join our survey. So we have an, a survey app, and they, they fill out the survey, and we ask these specific questions in there in order to try to get their, their attitudes to draw them out. And through these uh, emotional cues that we collect, we basically deliver our you know, reports and, and values to the, to the client. So this is how we essentially make money. So what's behind the approach? Um, the, the whole Bayesian survey is based on two uh, central parts. The first part is the wisdom of crowds concept. Now, the wisdom of crowds is a familiar concept to some, I, I, I might assume. Uh, the story is basically that we ask you what you think is going to happen, right? So I'm not asking you about your opinion directly, I am, but I'm also asking you about what other people think. So that's kind of the, the point of the approach, right? So I want to see basically what other people around you think. So we ask our participants three basic questions. First of all is to express a preference or on a, you know, a product or a given issue. So for example, COVID vaccines, right? Um, or for, for a specific political candidate. And then we, we ask them how do they think that other people feel about the same issue, right? So is the candidate going to win? Um, are people going to buy this product? Is this, you know, are people going to get vaccinated? That, that sort of thing. And then finally, how do you think that other people would answer the previous questions? So see, with these two additional questions, we try to get kind of in, uh, uh, in, in depth to, uh, to try and trying to understand your approach and how you think about these things. So specifically, as I already mentioned, so we have users logging in, for example, by Facebook or Twitter, other options as well, and these are the types of questions that they're answering, right? So this is what we had in our first survey, uh, one of the first ones that we did for the Trump versus Hillary uh, elections in 2016 in America. Um, so we were asking them what percentage of the population of Pennsylvania, for example, is going to vote for your candidate, and then people basically they use these sliders to give their uh, to give the idea of who's going to vote, uh, who's going to win. But then we asked them, you know, who do you believe that others? How do you believe others in Pennsylvania would respond to the previous question? Now, when people come to this last question, they kind of start thinking, and they they. What we noticed, at least, and we did this experimentally, we did it with students uh, asking them about test scores, we did it with political candidates, we did it with a lot of, a lot of different uh, um, um, uh, ways of, of trying to figure it out. So people, tried, people tend to self-correct, right? So they, they figure out, all right, so what about, you know, I'm trying to put myself in the mindset of others, and then I self-correct my own answers from before, hence the Bayesian approach. That's the, that's the idea. Uh, but the point here is not necessarily, um, so, so the point here is to, to get this particular, to get them to think, essentially, right? So our questions are, as you can see them here, they're deliberately convoluted, right? So we want people to, you know, spend a few minutes or, you know, a minute or two, at least, to think about the questions that they're being asked and give us the answer. So this is the first part, right? The, the wisdom of crowds. Then comes the second part, the bubble part, right? So the bubble part is that we take every single one of these individuals um, and pull them in a network of their friends, right? So we have, so we do this by social media. This is why we do it by social media, so that we can get your friendship networks as well, so that we can figure out who your friends it, who your friends with, and you know how do they express their preferences. Obviously, 
these people have to come into the survey as well. So you share it, et cetera, et cetera. So what we have here is a network of individuals. So this is 6,000. This was our first election that we did. It was 6,000 people uh, in the survey. Uh, every little, so every one person is one uh, a little circle. And the, the central circle in the middle, for example, is the person who got in the most other, uh, most other people in, right? So from their, from their share. And the colors are pro different political parties. So there's like 10 political, different political parties. So what's most, most interesting here is that when we make our prediction this way, we're looking for biased groups. So we're trying to uncover bubbles and lower the weight that they have in, in our predictions. Why? So for example, this yellow circle down there. Okay? So the yellow circle represents a typical cluster, a typical bubble. Right? People who only hang out with each other. Right? So they have, um, uh, so for example, this is one political party, and when they enter a survey, they say, my political party is going to get 50% of the votes. Right? In real life, this party got less than 5% of the votes, right? But so, so this tells me, this signals me, as the, as the surveyor, um, that these people essentially are very biased and they only hang out with like-minded individuals, so they only see one version of the truth. They only see their own version of the truth. And that's the problem, right? So when, we, when these people come in, we give, them, we give them a very low weight, Okay, similar to this red group or the green one, etc. What I want are people up here, right? So heterogeneous groups. So in terms of election, the context of elections, some of your friends are right wing, some of them are left left wing, some of them are centrist. So this gives you a much higher probability of being right, okay, of being right in your prediction. It doesn't necessarily mean so none of these people guessed the outcome of an election perfectly, right? But these people up up here have a much higher probability of being right than the people down here. That's the whole point of the approach, and that's how we weight individuals, and we get one joint prediction from uh, uh, from the sample. I just explained the, explained the whole thing. So the basic point here is that the network is used to balance the sample, so we no longer have to have a standard representative sample. I'll show you this later on the example of the latest, the, the Biden-Trump uh, election, how we didn't have a representative sample, but still managed to get a, a very accurate prediction, much better than, than regular polls. Since we're on the topic of polls, they have, a, they have a specific problem, right? So the polls are not, in, a, in, in themselves, they're not predictions. That's the first and foremost, right? Polls are snapshot, snapshots of voters, voter attitude over time, meaning that if you want to figure out how a certain election is going to end up, you have to, you, you have to basically connect the dots, right? You have to see uh, the trends of the, of the polls. However, they do have bad rep, especially given the latest uh, errors in, over the past five, ten years. And the problem is, there's two basic problems. The first one is that the response rate to polls is very, very low. So it's down to only 6%. This is down from 36% in 1997. Now, what this means is, let me, let me paint you a picture. So if you want to get a sample of 600 people, which is not a lot, Okay, but if you want a sample of 600, you need to call 10,000 people in order to get your 600 responses. Right? That's a lot. So you're missing a lot of responses in these 9,400 9, 9, people that are not responding to the survey. That's the non-response bias. Right? You're not capturing someone who you should. Back in 1997, you only, you only needed to call for 600. You, you only needed to call uh, 2,000 people in order to get, your, to get your sample. So there's a big difference here. What the pollsters are aware of this, obviously, and they're trying to fix it with models. Okay, so in 2020, for example, they adjusted their models by including non-educated or low-educated voters, because they were saying, oh, we made the misses last time in 2016 because, because we didn't include low-educated voters. Now they did, and their error was even bigger in 2016, in 2020 than in 2016. And that's because of this, right? Um, this is an example from, from the New York Times from 2016. They gave a survey, so they commissioned a survey, and they gave the data to five different pollsters. And five different pollsters gave five different responses on the same data set. Right? Ranging from a Trump victory to a Clinton victory, right? to, to several different levels of, of Clinton victories. So that's the point. So they're using different models, and you know, the precision of your model determines the precision of the survey. But what we're saying is, you know, forget the models. Okay? So the models are not going to be helpful here. We need to completely rethink the way this is being done, which is what we've, what we've done, and these are some of our outcomes. Okay? So um, in 2016, we predicted uh, with incredible precision that Trump is going to win uh, the popular vote, uh, not the, po the, the electoral college vote, but that Hillary Clinton is going to win the popular vote. And we saw this, it was within a single percentage point for the key swing states, notice Pennsylvania, Florida, North Carolina, etc. 
the same methodology uh, six months before that or five months before that for Brexit, it gave us 51.3% for leave, the actual outcome was 51.9. So again, incredible, incredible accuracy. Uh, this is simply, um, this is called the calibration of the model. Calibration means that how close you are to the 45 deg degree line, the more precise the model, right? The far farther away you are from the 45 deg degree line, the less precise you are. And again, you can see that our error was less than 1%, whereas the other pollsters were, were systematically underestimating Trump by four points on average. We got some media attention for that. And in 2020, we did it again. This time we were selling it. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't done um, publicly. We were selling it to, to our clients, people in the finance industry, and a lot of individual, individual clients as well. And they wanted to figure out that people were betting on the outcome. That's why they were buying our predictions. Um, what we told them immediately that there's, that there's no chance of a blue wave happening, which, which was something that, was the, that the pollsters were predicting. That blue wave meaning that there's going to be a Biden sweep, that he's going to you know, win all the major states. This didn't happen. We predicted successfully that Florida was going to go for Trump, plus Ohio, Texas, Iowa, and some others. And the polls have significantly underestimated Trump once again in these, in these states. But we correctly called Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania the key northern states. If, if you recall, these were the states that we were waiting for uh, during the election week for them to call, uh, a couple of days they needed to, to call these states. Our final prediction was an electoral college at 294. It ended up in 306, so it was, again, much, much more precise than any of the, any of the others. Um, just to show you, to, to, to visualize the errors, so these are for, for our predictions versus the final outcome, and this is the polling averages. So the polling averages, the errors were about 4 to 5% for these states, even 7% for Florida, Ohio. For us, it was 1% here, a little bit more here, but we, get, we, guessed, we, we uh, correctly estimated the, right, the winner of the, of the race. Um, overall, again, you can see the calibration of the model, the same thing that I showed you last uh, in, in the previous slides. Again, a 1% one percent error, whereas the pollsters had this time six between six to seven percent errors, so which is pretty pretty large, right? Once again, inc incredible precision. Again, uh, uh, model calibrations. This is simply to show you. So th this is the difference between Trump and Biden. This is the actual Trump vote. Notice how much. So the the, the orange ones are the polls. Notice how much they've significantly underestimated Trump once again, right? Uh, so even though they fixed their models, they still haven't been able to uh, make the accurate accurate prediction in this case. Uh, just a few more stats here, what I wanted to show you. So we anticipated contested elections immediately from the start. Um, we saw this in terms of our, the probabilities of outcomes in certain states, but we also saw this when we asked people, do you expect a contested election? So you do expect the results to be known on election night, right? And this was very important in terms of our communications to the clients, telling them, right, so it's not going to happen the way you think. Um, we're going to have a, a, an election week instead of an election night where, where we're going to uh, count the votes and then you had the whole Trump situation. So this was basically anticipated by us in our, in our reports. In terms of representative sample, this is what I wanted to emphasize. So our sample was clearly skewed towards Biden. So if this was a regular poll, we, like just a normal poll where we ask people, who do you vote for? We would have Biden winning by 12%, which is not what happened, right? Um, so, so it did. But however, even though we had this kind of a skewed poll, which is an online poll, obviously all online polls are skewed, it was still more precise than the the others, without having the necessity to have a representative sample. This is because of the network approach that I explained, right? So that's the key, the key element, the key part. So our sample was still fairly balanced between them. In terms of age and party affiliation, this was more or less expected, as, as, you, as you might have seen. Um, the Trump votes were losing a little bit more to Biden. This is something that gave us a signal that the, the Biden campaign is uh, more successful in converting Trump votes than the Trump campaign in converting uh, um, former Democratic voters. Um, so, and, and just finally, to, to compare these predictions, um, to other pollsters that I mentioned, and not just pollsters, but also polling aggregation models, betting models, etc. Funny story here. So, in terms of the betting odds, they were all giving Biden uh, a higher probability of winning, so about 62% to 36%. Uh, last time, in 2016, they were giving Hillary about 80% chances of winning. Um, okay, so this time they were correct, eventually Biden won, but on election, the day after election night, Right? So when the first states were called in Trump's favor, so Florida, Ohio, etc., all the states that we predicted correctly and the pollsters haven't. Um, so when, when that happened, the betting odds were switching towards Trump. 
Okay? So if in that case, if you bet against Trump and for Biden, you would have earned even more money. And this is what some of our clients did. Uh, so they were uh, on election day, the day after when I sent, I, we, we were sending out emails saying, you know, this is, you know, stay calm. Things are going to go in the expected direction. Uh, it's not going to happen uh, in the way that these betting odds are predicting. Um, or the prediction markets, right? So, so, so there was uh, a sort of a huge levels of uncertainty, especially in the day after the election, while we were very confident in our model and it paid out. Now, in addition to uh, making predictions about elections, there's one other thing that I wanted to, to, to share with you. So we, we, we talk, I talked about predicting products and predicting um, vaccinations and COVID. That, that's a bit boring, in my opinion. But what's much more interesting in this case is trying to predict this. I'm saying trying to predict. I'm not saying that we will or that we have uh, succeeded. Not yet, at least. Um, so what we want to do is not necessarily predict markets on, in the short run, because the, these fluctuations are very unpredictable, but markets, if you think about them, are pure, pure psychology. And this is what I want to figure out. Right? I want to figure out the social media sentiment that's driving market psychology. I don't know how much you followed uh, lately the markets, but you might have heard of you know, things like Dogecoin or Bitcoin or the Reddit army or GameStop, all these things like meme sto stonks. I said stonks are stocks that only go up. Uh, or YOLO, you only live once, where you YOLO your entire life savings into one meme stock. Um, <laughs> things like that. Now, if, if you haven't, you know, seen the, these, these things or figured them out, you're not aware of, of, uh, uh, you know, of the huge retail army and what's happening in, um, uh, uh, in the markets right now. Now, the situation, what we have in ever since 2020, ever since the pandemic, is a huge influx of retail traders in the market. And these retail traders, this is pure psychology, right? It's pure emotion. There's, no, um, there's, there's, there's not a lot of, you know, uh, let's say, credentials behind their decisions. This is people betting, Okay, or you know, betting based on social media sentiment, betting based on what their friends are saying, which is perfect for our methodology, right? So I want to know what you're saying, what your friends are saying, and I want to try to you know extract that to get the right information. That's the idea. Um, this is a quote here from the Financial Times saying that you know rather than criticizing retail investors, it's better to you know slot them into the money equation. That's basically the pitch that we're doing here. Uh, so retail traders, as, as you see, they're taking off again. Huge influx of retail traders in 2020, 2021. The question is here, uh, the, the, the issue here is, if, could you have anticipated any of these movements of, for example, Bitcoin or GameStop using fundamental analysis or technical analysis, which, which is what you usually do uh, when you bet on stocks, bet, buy stocks. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's no fundamentals behind the GameStop movements, no fundamentals behind Bitcoins. It's, it's, there's no technicals either, right? They're, they're not useful here. What's useful here is understanding the psychology, so understanding why people are doing this, so understanding what's behind the whole Bitcoin uh, or the cryptocurrency scare and what's behind the GameStop situation. This is what we want to uncover. So what we're doing is we're running a survey. It's ongoing every week for the next six months. We're doing it in the United States and the United Kingdom. But it's open throughout, throughout the world. The focus is on the U.S. because we're asking US based, ba the prediction of U.S.-based indices. So S&P 500, Dow Jones, uh, the, the Treasury yield, which is very important because you need to understand the bond market in order to understand the stock market, uh, the prices of oil, Bitcoin, etc., Dogecoin as well. Uh, so we, we're trying to, we, we want to see how the social media sentiment translates into actually making these predictions. I don't want to give out any results now. I'm, I'm very happy with them for, after the first few weeks. Um, but, you know, so far so good. Let's see what happens after six months and whether or not we have a similar killer, uh, very interesting product. Thank you very much for your, for your time.